Welcome to a Lunch with Biggie, a podcast about small business and creatives sharing their stories and inspiring you. My guest today is a writer, a poet, an artist, a teacher, and a wanderer. Uh, please welcome the writer behind By Chance, Not Fine, and Fine Tuning, Carrie Love. What's going on, Carrie? Hi, how are you? I'm doing I'm doing really well. I'm super excited that we get to chat, um, mostly because of the fact that I've known you, and I was thinking about this, I think we've known each other for almost 30 years. Oh, good Lord. Would Maybe a little like bit that? less than that. I know it sounds like <laughs> it sounds like a very long time, but um, and but no. So I truly we will talk more about kind of that. But I, I definitely appreciate you uh, hanging out with me during my lunch break. Um, my my usual first go to thing is what's your go to lunch sandwich? Now, I don't know if this is cheating or not, uh, but my favorite sandwich and the one that I've eaten the most in my entire life is a breakfast sandwich. And I will eat them for breakfast, lunch or dinner. I am a breakfast sandwich aficionado. Okay, so when you say breakfast sandwich, what is your definition? What's in the breakfast sandwich? Okay, so I change it up a little bit. But right now, currently, my favorite is to take one of those Trader Joe's hash brown patties, get it real crispy in the air fryer. And then put a fried egg on it. And I make this like kind of schmear with like garlic Cholula and some fresh garlic and some mayo and then some nice American cheese, maybe some green onions and a uh, big old slice of sourdough. I, I like that. That actually is very good. I'm a big fan of using the hash brown, inserting a hash brown inside my breakfast sandwich. I'm a big fan of that as well. Agreed. That is a that yeah. You can pretty much. I mean, you got the protein. You got all that stuff. You can have it. Why can't you have dinner? People have breakfast for dinner. Why not? You can have it anytime you want, and it's exactly. quick and easy. That's the beauty of exactly. it. Exactly. Um. So, like I like I brought up, I've known you for a while. Um. Yeah. And the reason I know you for a while is because I've known you since college. Fresh um, freshman year, I think. Freshman, right. Your freshman year. Yeah. So I freshman year of college, and and I. Uh, I was like friends and and which is amazing because it kind of is leads to some of the stuff that we're going to talk about in the sense of like how you wrote your first book um, and all of those things. But we'll we'll and we'll kind of maybe jump in in a little bit about that when we went to college. But I guess I want to talk more. I want to spend more time talking about like where you got like a little bit about that like love of writing where the creativity comes from, where let's, let's start from there. Because one of the things that I enjoyed about your bio is the fact that you said like, you used to be the little one, like the person that would go underneath like your covers and like, and like be writing and writing things. And your friends would want to like see what you're creating as well as you're reading. So I kind of want to little talk a little bit about where that kind of background comes from and then where you got that love to actually write and create things. Yeah. It probably started with my mom. She was an elementary or she was an elementary school teacher. And so like the love of books was always there. The love of words was always there. It was a big part of my childhood. And I went actually went home this last Christmas and went through a box of my old writing and found these things from elementary school and middle school that said, like, what do you want to be when you grow those kinds of things? And it said a poet and a writer. And I had somewhere around college age, I just got real cynical. And I just let all of that go. And I pursued like a career in radio. And it wasn't until after my marriage ended that I really kind of got back to who I was, the essence of who I was. And that's when the poetry started coming again. And I hadn't really written much poetry since college or since actually high school. And then as I kind of came back to myself um, and dropped the cynicism, the creativity came back in. It's funny. I don't think those two can like live coexist. No, I I think you're absolutely right. There's got to be some level. And I think a lot of it is because of when you're creative, there is a certain level of, uh, I don't know, like, I, I don't know, like an air of like, of like wonderment and like, and like you kind of have to have, you know what I mean? Like you need to have yes. that in order for imagination to work. So like imagination is not rigid, it's fluid. Uh, and I think yeah. that's a cynical part of it is like that cynicism usually is very rigid and tight. So that would make sense. You put it in a box so you can't, you know, you can't roam, roam free. So, uh, so I totally get that. Yeah. Um, so one of the things, so one of the things that I, I, I thought was interesting, cause so, so, because of that and you saying like, you know, hey, I just started writing the first thing that you wrote or at least that was published and all of that was like you and ironically, your your best friend since like elementary school, who I also yes. know through college, um, yes. Jill, uh, you both wrote like a super sexy romantic comedy called like by chance. So I, yes, I kind of wanted a little, a little know a little bit about that. But yeah. I also wanted to talk about like, how did that come about? Because. You know, that's something like it's two people writing it. 
So like, how did that kind of, how does that kind of work when you're like doing like dual writing and, uh, and going back and forth, how did you approach it? And then also at the same time you self published it. So like, I want to talk, talk a little bit about some of that, like creativity of where, what made you decide, Hey, we're going to do this. We're going to work together and then I'm going to publish it. Sure. Absolutely. So obviously Jill and I have been friends since we were like seven and, um, and you know, a long friendship like that, you go in and out of closeness. But uh, around the time that I was finishing up grad school, she said, have you read this book, 50 Shades of Grey? And I'm like, oh, I've heard of it, but I don't really have any desire to read it. That's not really my thing or whatever. And she's like, no, 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 you have to read. It. And so she got me to read 50 Shades of Grey. And we started talking about it. And I was like, you know, the story was not my favorite. But I really did kind of like the sexy part. Like I liked reading about yeah. I was surprised how much I liked reading about sex. And she's like, we should write a book. And I was like, you know what? We should write a book. And so it took us a really long time because Jill owns her own business. She's a busy mom. Like she she has a lot going on. And so um, we just kind of pieced it together over many years. We would sometimes take little vacations together and work on it, which, and sometimes we would set up meetings each week and work on it. I did the majority of the writing, but all of the story and the constructing we did together. And we, um, we kind of brought the characters to life with our analyzations of like, you know, <laughs> people and their idiosyncrasies. And so they started becoming like people that we were talking about as opposed to like gossiping about people yeah. we were literally creating the characters to talk about. And, and then we, we tried a little bit to do, go the traditional route at an agent and stuff. But the thing about our work is it doesn't really fit in erotica because it's not a kind of like Fabio on the cover kind of romance, steamy romance like that. And it didn't really fit in like rom-com women's lit because it, the, scenes are pretty steamy yeah. and so we so we decided well you know what we kind of created our own genre it's called eroticom and it's it's our own thing and and you know agents and stuff like that and people that are real in the industry they're in such a almost like what we were talking about with creativity they're in like a stuck mindset of like what's going to sell let me see what worked before let yeah. me and so there's not a lot of chance taking on new things and so i was like you know what we really enjoyed reading this the friends that we've shared this with have enjoyed reading this why don't we just put it out there and see what happens and so we went through the self publishing process and it's just beautiful that i mean as as much as you want to have a problem with you know the big companies it does give us a chance as creatives a chance to to not be have that gatekeeping yeah. going on of you have to be accepted by someone else before you can put your work out there. And so I love that about where we're at now. Yeah. What, how hard, how difficult was the process for you to like self, for you guys to self publish it? Do you know, I think the most difficult process was believing in ourselves. The actual process of it was pretty easy. Um, there's plenty of YouTube videos that can help you with that. It's pretty straightforward. There's a, the software I like to use is called Scrivener and it's pretty affordable and it makes it really easy to like export the final product. Uh, but the hardest part was just believing in ourselves enough yeah. that this was, that this was, this was worthwhile and that enough people would like it, that it was worth our time to do it. And that we were proud enough of ourselves to share something like this, because there's a, there's a, you have to really believe in yourself enough to not, and, and there's a shame element when it comes to being a woman writing about sex. I was going to say there's a stigma. And that was like the one thing that I, I admired so much because of the fact that like, it's like, you're, you're kind of putting it out there, you know, uh, yeah. and, and that's kind of, that's, that's something that a lot of times people keep private or don't want to like say, you know, this is kind of what I like, or this is whatever, yeah. and, like, or however anyone wants to take it or have innuendos of it. Well, and I think that's why 50 shades of gray just blew up the way it did because everybody wanted to read that, but nobody wanted to admit that they were reading that kind of stuff. So it kind of gave people permission to read that. Yeah. And, and now I think that there's definitely a market for that, especially because so many of us are more um, creatively stimulated that way than necessarily watching something that someone else has created, whereas you can have your own mental kind of thing going on. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I, I, I thought it was great. Have you guys talked about with like, so let's, let's do like a quick little, give me a little, give a teaser. So if someone wanted to be like, Hey, I want to, I want to, I'm, Ooh, I'm intrigued by, by chance. Cause it's, you know, it's kind of like that, you know, 
like you like the genre that you said i'm like oh i kind of like yeah. that give people a little bit of a teaser of what uh you know like the back back page insert of what by chance is okay so by chance is this woman who is she's kind of gone through some stuff and she teaches college and one the first day of the semester her boss tells her that there's a movie star that wants to prep for a role that he's in and he's going to be taking her class. And she's not really about that life. And so she's kind of hesitant. She doesn't really want her boss micromanaging her. Um, but this guy kind of comes into her class and then we go from there. But it, we also don't shy away from some realistic stuff that happens too. So there's the first sex scene is actually very realistic um in that it's not good yeah <laughs> and i think most women can relate that there have been partners that you've been with that are actually not good um uh, so it's not just a fantasy you, yeah. you know there's there's some elements Reality. to it that are yeah there's some elements to it that make it a little bit more grounded which is the kind of book that we wanted to read yeah. we wanted the 50 shades of gray but we wanted it to be a little bit of a fantasy, but with more realistic elements that we felt like people could relate to. No, I thought it was great. I bought it. I did buy it for my wife. And uh, I also have, <laughs> I, I did buy it for my wife. And I also, did she read it? yes, she did read it. And also <laughs> um, I did, I do listen to, cause that was the other thing I saw. I noticed on your Instagram reels, the two of you guys were taking turns reading the book. So I yes. would, I would listen to the reels. Um <laughs> some uh, for the most part i would listen to the reels as much yeah. as uh you know as you guys were reading through the chapters so that was definitely good um yeah. the other thing i wanted to kind of talk about because i know obviously you wrote that and then that kind of led you so that kind of led you i guess to obviously deciding to kind of release poetry um yeah. is what i'm assuming and so like i know as a child you wrote poetry and for many i would say it's very personal to be able to do that um and then so can you talk a little bit about what led you to kind of have that courage to kind of to release, you know, not fine. And now I believe like in, like in a few months or a pretty short, it just came months, out. It did come out. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, define tuning. So like, yeah. can you talk a little bit about where that comes from? Um, you know, like that kind of evolution of where you kind of decided to kind of keep some of these personal things that you've kind of started writing and then to actually decide to let it like kind of, you know, share it and publish it. It's, it's been a long time coming. I started writing poetry when I was uh, going through a divorce and I, I always wanted to dedicate a book to my mom that was kind of on my bucket list, if you will. And I wasn't going to dedicate the, <laughs> the sexy novel yeah. to her. That's not my <laughs> mom's style. <laughs> so the, I really used that as my goal to give me the courage to put the poetry out there. I thought here, my mom really instilled in me the love of words, the love of poetry. You know, here's an opportunity for me to put something out that's dedicated to her um, and all that she's done for me and taught me. And that gave me the courage to do it because I was like, I don't want to wish that I had done that. And here's and that kind of gave me the courage to to just be like, go ahead. This is this is my goal. Like I didn't have any goal above and beyond actually yeah. having a book dedicated to my mom. So in a way, when I put out fine tuning, which is the follow up to not fine, there's actually going to be three. It's a trilogy. Uh, fine tuning was in some ways harder because I had already dedicated that book to my mom. So fine tuning was kind of saying this I'm actually doing, I'm actually choosing to put this out here. And I don't have any other, I don't have any other reasons to do it other than I've had people tell me that my poetry helps them. And so I'm just going to keep doing it. And, and that I was surprised after putting out the first two, I thought it would be a lot easier, but there was still kind of the emotion, the fear and the anxiety and the doubt and all of those things that every creative person has to overcome that I think for those of us that consume so much content, we don't realize what's going on behind the scenes and and with the creators that have to battle this kind of self-doubt every day. And I know you know what that's like because you are such a creative being and you're always mm -hmm. putting out cool things. Yeah, that's something that, and it's funny that because that was something I, I, I enjoyed listening to you talk about that and sharing that about that anxiety um, the idea, and I also thought it was very interesting because you posted, um, I saw a thing that you posted about with not fine, how it was so many, there's so many different 
people that kind of like you were inspired you through it everything from like loves to people you dated to your even your own students as a teacher so it's like it's um you know it's 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 very it's it's a it's a deep it's definitely deep in the sense that i i and i and i laughed because like you said like even your some of your family is like wow I'm like why so deep but i mean th that sometimes that's where you write that's where you get your most inspiration sometimes is when you're in in certain those points uh in your life it's like it's a lot harder to be able to do and so what's your creativity process like how how does that kind of work when you're kind of doing this? Um, is it one of those, like you have a, a notebook, you do it on like a phone, like when things start inspiring you, what talk a little bit about that kind of like creative process that you go through. Um, for me, it's become that I'm not very strict about anything. This is why I have all different kinds of projects. Yeah. Uh, but I do try to sit down with my notebook every morning. And it's, you know, there's every once in a while I miss a day, but for the most part, every morning I try to do two to three pages kind of based on Julia Cameron's The Artist Way. It was a program that I did one summer and just getting that stuff out uh, just allows for more stuff to come in. So it's, it's sitting with the journal and then I'll come back to it depending on what's, what's going on with me. If I'm processing some heavy emotions, yeah, I got the journal next to me because I never know what's going to come out. The best poetry comes through me and it's usually born out of something that I am very, that big feelings, like not fine. The whole centerpiece of the not fine book is all the ways that I was not feeling fine. I actually wrote it during a panic attack. Um, in the October of 2020, you know, when, when our country was in such turmoil and we were, you know, we're still dealing with COVID and now we're really peeling back the layers of the inequality that that's going on in our country. Yeah. And I just was overwhelmed and I was having a panic attack and it turned into like a list of all the ways that I was not fine because we so, so often people are, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. You know, but none of us really are. We're not fine. <laughs> and we shouldn't be not yeah. in this world right now, because it, it needs so much change and it needs so much heart. So for me, anytime I'm feeling not fine, that's when the notebook's there. Or if I'm out on a walk, I'll, I'll put it in my phone. I've got a journal app on my phone that I write in when I'm out on a walk. And I always, I, I think to me when I'm going on a walk, that's like a lot of times where my mind can kind of like, depending if I'm listening to music or if I don't listen to music, then you're lost in your thoughts. And then that's kind of even more so for it to be able to do. Um, when you say you write in the morning or do you write usually, is there a particular time you write in the morning, first thing in the morning? I try to the first thing in the morning. Yeah. And then do you have verb like cues that you go with or you just kind of like, I'm just going to write for, I'm just going to write and just whatever comes out, comes out. Yeah. Yes. And I think cues can be really, really helpful when you're, when you're first starting, but I've been doing this for so long that it's not something that I feel like I need anymore, but yeah, absolutely. Journal prompts and stuff like that. There's so many, there's so many great creators out there that can offer you those kinds of suggestions yeah. that, and, but really it starts with like, just what's on my mind, you know, and, and sometimes I'll meditate first. Sometimes I'll sit there and meditate first for a little bit and see what kind of things are coming through. Like you mentioned the tarot cards earlier. And, yeah. and that's something that I tarot card reading is something else that I do. But really, it's storytelling. It's storytelling with help from your energy help from the energy of, you know, your guides, for lack of a better term, if if you're not woo woo, I apologize yeah. if that's not your thing. But um but it's been really helpful for me. So sometimes I'll even pull a card and that'll go, oh, okay, this is what this energy is, is doing right now. This is why I'm feeling this way. But it's really just sitting in your feelings and, and, and asking yourself, what's going on? You know, where, like, am I anxious? Am I calm? Where in my body do things feel stuck? What's on my mind? Those kinds of things. And it just kind of goes from there. I I think, and one of the things I've learned in the last few years is kind of that aspect where sometimes we're very uncomfortable to be in our emotions and to actually sit in it. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think we are very, you know, prone to being on our phone 54 times a day and just kind of not, you know, and not actually trying to sit in it because no one wants to kind of deal with it. Um, and that's always a tough one when it comes to it. So that's why it's like, to me, I think it's amazing when you 
people like you that actually will like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm not only going to you know write it and get it and sit in it and like marinate in it and actually like let's let it out. But then I want to be able to share it and maybe help someone else to be able to be inspired by it, or at least to be able to be like, wow, I'm like, I feel the same way or I felt those, I felt those emotions. Um, you know, that's kind of one of the reasons why I think so many people love like the breakup songs and all the sad songs because everyone has experienced these things. And sometimes it's very hard to be able to put it into words to be able to then, you know, be able to actually feel it and be able to take it in. Yeah. And then when we, when we, when you read a line of poetry or you hear a lyric and you think, oh, I thought I was the only one. And then you remember you're not alone. Like all of our individual experiences, I can never know what you've experienced. Not really, but the feelings that we all feel are the same. Like how we get to those feelings are different, different events that happen in our lives. But the feelings at the core, I think, are all the same. And when we can remember that, we can remember our humanity. And and when we remember our humanity, everything can change. Like the ripple effect from that is so huge. And I was surprised when I put out not fine that I knew it would resonate with women my age who have been through similar things. But what I didn't anticipate was how many men felt really connected to what I was saying. And then I realized, oh, I'm not writing about necessarily just women stuff. It's feelings. And we all have feelings. Yeah. And and men especially have been so at a disadvantage because they've been so conditioned to not experience their emotions that they're you know, some of them just don't even know how. And that's, you know, it's such a, it's such a handicap for them. And I, I feel for them. I think we all need to have the rich experience of life. No, I I totally, I totally agree with that a hundred percent of the, of the way. Um, a few things I kind of wanted to, one of the things I, and I always enjoy watching, uh, your, your reels or just listening to you talk. Um, and so I, I kind of had a few, few things I wanted to ask about that. Cause a lot of times you, you will put stuff out there and I, and for a long time I was putting stuff out there and then I just kind of stopped. Is there, is there an underlying reason why you decide you want to share some of these, some of these things? Because I feel like, like for a little bit of time, at least for me, like personally, I was doing it because I felt like I needed to hear it. And so therefore I shared these things um, because I thought maybe if I needed to hear it, someone else would need to hear it. But I'm always kind of curious, like when you share these things, like, you know, like, Hey, today's I'm feeling this or who's feeling that. Like, you're just kind of like sharing your day or sharing the energy. And I'm just kind of curious, like why, 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 what poses you or what, I guess, what's the impulse to have you be able to do that and share it? It started, uh, it started last semester. I I felt better. I would, I would pull into the parking garage at work uh, where I teach, I teach college students. And I would think, wow, it was felt really intense on the ride to school today. And these are things that I've been talking to my students about in class for years and years and years. And I started realizing that most of my followers are former students. And so this is a way for me to keep connecting with them past our time together in the classroom. And I've gotten so much feedback from them that say, hey, it's really helpful. Or if I post something, it just reminds people that they're not alone that they're not the only ones feeling this way and that they're not crazy for feeling this way. And so I I thought I I do it when I feel inspired to, I almost feel like I wait for a nudge, but I mostly do it to keep connecting with my students. And if it helps other people, awesome. But the majority of the people, the way I'm doing it is the same way that I do it in my classroom every morning. Okay. I like that. No, I think it's great. Um, It's very similar to a, one of my pre- previous guests, um, Billy from Kitchen Killers, he does something similar like that before he goes to work or before he leaves for work. He'll have like some thought and he'll like kind of just put it out there. Um, and I think it's great. I think it's I think it's great to be able to share those things because you do have there is an underlying thing that kind of helps, um, you know, not just yourself, but helps other people when it comes to it, especially if you're feeling it, because um, a lot of times, you know, some people say, hey, you're oversharing like they, you know, but other times I think like you kind of need you, you do like, it's amazing how someone you'll get random person. They'll be like, Oh my gosh, I miss this. Or I love the fact that you share these things. Um, one thing that I appreciated, which kind of makes sense based on the fact of how you kind of, I'll say you're, you're comfortable marinating in your own feelings is that you, uh, you know, you're about admiring the view of on your journey. Um, is one thing that you've said, I've heard you say before, 
And I kind of wanted you to talk a little bit about that because you, you know, kind of like you've gone through a journey um, and, you know, everything from what you've experienced in your, in your, in your past. Um, I know at one point, you know, and I, and I, you and I've talked about this, you've faced adversity, you've suffered a stroke at like, uh, you know, in your late twenties, early thirties. Yeah. And so like, and then you basically had to like, almost you know, relearn so many different things. So your perspective changes um, your life perspective and your life, everything changes. So I kind of wanted to hear a mixture of that with the idea of also being able to kind of actually like, you know, I guess taking a moment to actually look up and actually admiring the view as you're going through whatever you're going through in life. Yeah. I, uh, I had a massive stroke at 28 shortly after my, uh, former husband, and I moved to Clemson and we were kind of alone up there. We had moved there for him to go to graduate school and we didn't have any family. We had some friends that we had just recently met, but we were new to the area. And so it was a real, real challenging thing. And they didn't think I was going to make it. So I was in ICU for a little while and I had to learn how to walk again. And I had to learn how to do math again, which really was hard <laughs> doing wow. math again. Uh, and it, I was so... I had always been praised for my brain. I think being raised by a teacher, you naturally become pretty good at, at doing school, right? Because you're raised before you even get there on how school is going to work. And so for me, it was really important to prove to myself that my brain worked again. So I really kind of, I went and got a master's degree to prove to myself that I, I was still smart, you know, cause I was very attached to that identity. And then as after we moved to Charleston, I just, I just realized that there wasn't that the medical community and the stuff that I learned from doing the research on my thesis, which was based around why I'd had a stroke, which happened from birth control pills and synthetic hormones and the dangers of that. And I won't get into that. Like that's a whole other podcast. You can definitely so see all. That. Yeah. You could definitely read all yeah. about all the different research she's done on her, uh, on her website. Uh, yes. Cause I know there's quite a bit of research articles that you have there that I was able to look at. Yeah. Yeah. There's, that's a whole rabbit hole that if you want to go down, you can find the links on my website. But uh, what I learned basically was like to open my mind that the medical community didn't have the answers I was looking for, that science wasn't having the answers that I was looking for. And that there was a lot more to life than just achieving things that there was a lot more going on. And that's when I started looking into like alternative therapies. And that's when I started noticing how sensitive I was to like energies. And I was able to clear up a lot of my health problems by dealing with my stuffed down emotions. Because after the stroke, I knew everybody wanted me to be fine. So I just said, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. This is why, you know, this is how not fine came to be yeah. was that I wanted to prove to everybody I was fine. I was fine. I was fine. I was handling it. I was fine. And, uh, and I just wasn't, you know, and that was a long time coming. And so, so just allowing my life to look different from what I expected, allowing, uh, you know, the end of my marriage, I never expected that not having children, I never expected that. And, and, and letting go of the control of that and just coming back to the things that actually bring me joy. Writing brings me joy. Taking walks in nature brings me joy. You know, we're not promised. We're not promised tomorrow. So what are you doing today that you actually enjoy? I mean, if you're constantly building for tomorrow, then tomorrow never really comes. It's yeah. always just, you know, and so, you know, Alan Watts talks about that. The philosopher Alan Watts talks about that a lot, that life isn't a journey because when we think of it as a journey, we're always constantly thinking of the Trying destination. Trying to get to like, a destination. Yeah. yeah. So he talks about it like a dance or like a, a, a musical score. Like the point isn't to get to the end. The point is the thing itself. And when I kind of shifted my focus to that and just in, started incorporating the things that bring me joy in my life, that's when I was able to kind of admire the view. And I yeah. notice so much more and it makes me a good poet to notice, right? Yeah. Because everything that's happening inside of us is also happening outside. We are mm -hmm. nature. We're not separate from it. Yeah. And it's funny because I had a, a previous guest that I had who's a storyteller. He, that was a big thing. He says he pretty much, Bobby Wesley basically says that he has like, he carries a notebook and he just kind of was like, he just makes it, uh, makes it a priority not to look at his phone so that instead of look up and actually take it in and see what's around him and, and take those moments in and see those things. And it is, a, it is, a, it is an amazing thing to do. I do it 
you know, I jokingly told him that I do it definitely when I sell at events. Like I try not to look at my phone. I try to look at the different people that I'm interacting with, see the people around you, how things are, you know, things that you don't ever notice because you don't take the time to notice. And I think you yeah. tend to have a better, deeper appreciation uh, yeah. when it comes to those things, when you're like, when you actually like, you know, stop and smell the roses, uh, you know, yeah. that type of thing. You are so good at that too. And you are so good at connecting with people and you're such a light that I think that it's important to remember that about yourself and, and how much you give just by being you and giving your space, yourself the space to be you. I was um, thinking about how the, the metaphor of like our compass, you know, mm -hmm. our internal compass and how it gets kind of spun out. And so I was thinking why I, I go on these little like, I don't know, these wormholes that I go down. And I'm thinking, well, I don't really know much about how a compass works. Like, how does a compass get thrown off? Because, yeah. like, compasses can get thrown off. Well, that's when I learned that a compass can be uh, demagnetized, mm -hmm. right? So then I Googled what kinds of things demagnetize a compass. And do you know what is one of the biggest magnets? What? Your cell phone. phone. And I thought, well, isn't that just the perfect metaphor? When we are too attached to our phones, we our compasses get demagnetized, yeah. right? And we got to get back into nature and find our true north. And so I noticed if I look at my phone first thing in the morning, I'm on it all day. But if I just take that time to get a cup of tea, write a few pages before I get on my phone, it's that much easier to put down a walk away. I like that. I like that. I also think that and it's something that I kind of battle with is like you, uh, the, the, like the non, the fit, the scrolling fatigue is one yeah. aspect. The other thing obviously is getting, um, getting caught up in our mind when you start looking at what other people are doing. Um, and then kind of like you get stuck on that and then you realize like, kind of like what you said, like on the back, like a lot of people don't know all the things that are going on behind the scenes. They just see what they're seeing in an image. Um, and I think to me, that's always a tough one when it comes to it, because, you know, like you don't, like a lot of people just don't sometimes, and, and I get it. Like there's like life, you know, we want to show the the happy sides of, of things or the great, or like, Oh, look, this is amazing. Look what I'm doing. But there's so many other elements. Um, and that's something that I appreciate when I appreciate with those that are actually open enough to actually share like, Hey, it's okay to be sad. It's okay to have a crappy day. It's okay to have a bad market, uh, you know, and things like that to be able to kind of, uh, you know, share with their, with the people around you to be able to kind of let them know that. Yeah. Yeah. And to, and to trust that for me too, cause I, you know, I'm a Leo, so I really like praise. <laughs> so is my but daughter. For, so she knows, right. You know? Uh, so for me, I have to remember that reaching one person is just as important as reaching a thousand that it's not up to me how many people are reached. It's it's up to me to do what I my heart is leading me to do and to not, not get attached to how many views, how many likes, all of those things. And so using the social media as a tool rather than letting it use me and give me value is has been a, a little bit of a, a, a learning curve, I'll yeah. say. <laughs> no, I totally get that. What, out of curiosity, speaking about energy and, and things like that, are there certain things that you kind of do when you're kind of in a funk to like get your besides, obviously I know one of them is going to be like going outside and doing walking nature, but are there any other things that you kind of do to kind of like almost like, uh, like, I don't know, like re-energize or re-centralize yourself, maybe centralize your, 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 your internal compass. Yeah. Uh, crying is a big one for me. I cry very regularly, obviously writing, uh, creating anything. Sometimes it's just as simple as like making myself a nice meal. Anything I can do to come back to taking care of myself. I started when I when my dog was getting older and I was really going through the the last stages of his life, which was tremendously hard because of his particular journey. I started giving myself massages at night. And so I started treating myself how I would want someone else to treat me if if there was someone else to take care of me. And so I'll make sure that I do those things. So maybe I don't feel like going for a walk today. Okay, can I at least sit on the deck and look at the trees? Like I might not have the energy to go for a walk, but can I at least get outside and get some sunshine on my face and touch the tree in my front yard? Okay, I did that. That's better. You know, that's a little bit better. Okay, maybe I don't want a salad, but can I at least make myself a breakfast sandwich? Yeah. Because, you you know, and so it's it's just 
the things that take care of ourselves are different in every moment. So not getting too attached to one is healthy and one isn't because I think they're all healthy in moderation. So I know you mentioned, uh, you know, you mentioned you've been teaching for, I want to say over 10 years now. And I kind of wanted to get a little bit of perspective on like, what do you, what did, what are some, what's some advice you're telling your kid, your your students um, as they go through your course, like as you're going, as you're teaching them, um, especially when they're like trying to start something or just, or just in general, when they're going through their journey of like trying to like actually get that stuff out. Yeah. So my journey with teaching was kind of interesting. I started teaching public speaking. Uh, which is interesting because I kind of loathe as an introvert, like I kind of loathe public, public speaking, but that also is what makes me so great at teaching it because most people hate it. So it's, it, my favorite part about teaching public speaking is not just that I learn from my students, right? Because I'm mm-hmm. being, uh, they, they give speeches all semester. So I become like this subject matter expert on so many little things just from listening to the speeches that they give me, but also teaching them how to show up as themselves, right? Because a lot of the speaking manuals are going to teach you that this is a good way to give a speech. But what I found over teaching public speaking for so many years is that the best speeches are when the person allows their authentic self to be seen. So those are the things that we would talk about. And and when I'm dealing with college age kids, like a lot of them don't know who they are, which of course they don't. You know, they're coming from their families and their friends from high school and they're they're trying on new identities because they're away from home for the first time. They're meeting new people. They're trying out different classes to see what kind of major they want to be in. And on top of that, they're, especially since COVID, post-COVID, they're in a world that is unlike anything we've ever seen. And so what I keep trying to, to, to really instill in them is that they will know their path the more they get to know themselves. And the more they get to know themselves, the more they will allow their true selves to shine. And that gives the people around them permission to do that too. And that makes our whole world better when we can accept everybody for exactly who they are, when we can accept ourselves for exactly who we are. They're not like those two things go so intimately hand in hand that that's the kind of atmosphere I try to build in my classroom. And and it's okay if they don't know who they are because we're gonna explore it over the course of the semester. Does that make sense? Did that answer your question? (laughs) I think it totally makes sense. Uh, And I think that's so true, true. I mean, it's kind of, I laugh because I remember when I was, uh, when I, at UCF, I had to take a capstone class where we had to do presentation. And I thought it was funny because like the, we did, I did very well, but I also, like, I'm very, I feel like I'm a little more unorthodox. I'm not very corporate in the sense that I'm like, not, I'm very, I'm more like you see my passion as I start talking. And then that's kind of how, what works for me verse and then so it was interesting to see because my teammate was very polished very like vice president like kind of very polished and i was very like like all over the place energy so but i think that's the part where i'm it's true to me i'm like and that's just how i am and i'm fine with that um and i appreciate that so like that's something that i think people can see those things when you're presenting or talking or or anything like that so and and that's the hardest part is trying to figure yourself out like who am i what am i um, you know, and what am I becoming? And and obviously that's the interesting thing about life is that who you are today is not who you are in, you know, in the next chapter of your life. Um, you know, and and we all evolve and you would hope that we continue to evolve um for the better. Yeah. And it's so true. And I think more than ever now, authenticity is the most valuable currency yep. that we can have. Because in a world of like fake news and false information and manipulation tactics and and AI now even <laughs> yeah. we are we as human beings are going to become more and more and more in t- attuned to authenticity and so I love that you showed up as you rather than trying to put on a suit and be somebody else because yeah. that's not who we really connect with we see those people as trying to sell us something yeah exactly and so yeah no, I, I love that. I, I think that hits the spot. Um, talking about, I'm always kind of like intrigued by the aspect of, um, and that's kind of, what's funny is that you and I, like we, you know, you follow each other on social and stuff like that. But during the pandemic, that's actually kind of how you and I connected. Cause we like, we started communicating again. And then I was like, Hey, 
you do you do tarot readings because you started talking about it and i was like i'm like i've never done one but i'm like if i'm gonna do it I'm, i'd rather do it with someone i know and trust and so we were i was able to do it with my wife and and you and i the three of us um and it's i find it very interesting because of the fact that how you can kind of um allow the energy and feel the energy even like in a on a on a zoom call or anything like that um can't i and i'm and i kind of i don't know i just kind of intrigued by that because i feel like you either like you how like how you're able to harness some of that and then be able to provide some of those um you know like those because i know a lot of people usually have like a desire to succeed or starting something or whatever and i'm always kind of curious on like that feeling you get with the universe on like how that kind of works um, and then how that kind of ebbs and flows on someone. So I've been surprised. I I've been doing tarot readings for a while. I, it's funny. I used to, I used to read people's palms in college at parties <laughs> and, uh, and I thought I was just kind of BSing them. But what I didn't realize was I actually was tapping into it. And I think that goes back to what we were talking about earlier about the, the human experience is your human experience is unique in that you have unique experiences, but the human experience is not unique. We're all having the same kinds of feelings and stuff. And so with the cards, the cards are really talking about the hero's journey. So it's really a natural extension of being a storyteller and being a writer. Uh, to look at the cards and go, okay, what's the story that's happening here? What are the court cards telling me about what energies are actually at play in your life right now? And then sometimes I just am dialed in enough to actually hear a specific message. Uh, but mostly it's how the energies are at work in your life and how you're going, how you can navigate them in the most easeful way. Like what kinds of things do you need to look at that are blocking you from the things that you want to experience, the things that you want to create, like where are you kind of tripping yourself up? And and it's always going to come back to yourself, but I've been surprised how much they resonate with people. And it it just reminds me too that that we all are the same yeah. when it comes down to it. No, I I think that's great. And I always uh I always enjoy whenever uh you and I get to interact and 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 chat because I I always you have a, an amazing energy yourself. So like, that's kind of one of the things. And, and that's, and that's something that I've at least kind of learned through the last few years is like, I, I like being involved and around people that have that provide energy because we have enough people that kind of take energy. Yeah. Um, so I definitely appreciate the fact that I'm able to get people who like re-energize me or at least kind of like, you know, kind of, they, they understand my energy and are, and are, you know, are, are so supportive about it. So I, I definitely, something I've always appreciated about you um, when it comes to that, what, for sure. What advice would you give someone wanting to start something? Start something new, uh, tenacity. I would say, don't be so hard on yourself when you need a break, but don't give up. It doesn't matter how many people have seen it. It doesn't matter how many people have liked it. But just keep going. And I and I see these I see these success stories all the time that it's like those are the people that succeed, the ones that just keep going. Like they I don't think anybody's really an overnight success. You know, we just see that because that's all we see. We don't see everything that's going on. And so switch gears if you need to. Like if you're if you really want to write a book. And, and you're sitting there and the writing sucks and it's hard and it's not fun and you're not enjoying it, then there might be something internal that you need to work on. So maybe it's time to like put the writing aside for a minute and switch gears and do something to that will help you believe in yourself. Take a pottery class or, uh, you know, watch a documentary of a creative. I love to watch other creative people, like other documentaries, listen to podcasts like yours, because all of that feeds into it creatively. So instead of like beating my head against the wall and being like, no, I'm going to sit down and write a novel for three hours today. I'll, if it's not coming, I'll switch gears and I'll go, how else can I, how else can I interact with my creativity? Okay. Maybe I need to go create a recipe in the kitchen instead. You know, but you just, you don't give up. You, you just find other ways to incorporate that, incorporate that creativity so that you're always kind of keeping the channel open, but you're not demanding the channel be something that it's not in that moment. I, I don't like, I'm not trying to like fight the flow. I'm trying to be in the flow. 
No, I get it. And when you're in the flow, it, it definitely obviously flows right out of you, everything else. Yeah. So that's kind of the key is like, it's amazing how easy it is once things, uh, when you don't kind of put the restriction on your brain um, to do those things. And, uh, and sometimes when it's forced, that's what happens. It's, there's like a, you, you, there's a blockage there. So yeah, no, I totally, yeah. uh, I totally get that. And I appreciate that. Where can people follow you? Where can they purchase uh, your literature, some of your art, uh, tell me, tell people where they can find all that. It'll be obviously in the show notes as well, but, um, where can they get, um, the books, the, the two books of poetry, uh, share, share that information for other, for the listeners listening. Probably the easiest place to start is Carrie Gretchen love. So that's K E R R Y Gretchen love.com. And then from there, that's my Instagram handle. That's my TikTok handle. That's my threads handle. Uh, and from there, there's links to everything. There's links to my medical research. There's links to my thesis. There's links to my artwork. There's links to my poetry. And of course, links to buy the books too. Yeah. And and I definitely recommend, even if like give her, definitely give her a follow, check out her work. Um, I do I appreciate listening to her in the morning and getting when she does leave a message, just because I do truly appreciate her uh sharing kind of like and and it's funny because there's a lot of times when she says something about energy and things like that like i feel it as well so then it's like okay i'm not going nuts that i'm also experiencing these things so i definitely yeah. uh i definitely love love uh lo- definitely give her a follow and definitely check out her stuff carrie thank you so much for being on and having lunch with me today i definitely appreciate it um that's our show for today thank you so much to carrie love for uh for being on definitely uh check out you know, and you'll see it on the in the show notes, Carrie Gretchen Love.com. You'll be able to see and be able to purchase um all her books. So you'll be able to, you know, if you're if you kind of like a little little comedy, a little arousal comedy. What was it? What was what do you call it? Eroticom. Oh, eroticom. I I would love I would watch movie eroticom movies. Um, right. Sure. I think that would be a, <laughs> awesome because I already love a good rom com and I'm all about the erotica. So uh, but you know, not that anyone my parents aren't listening to this, right? Uh, <laughs> sorry, mom and dad. I, no, I know the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely check out by chance. Um, and if you like, and if you like poetry, and even if you're not into poetry, I'm going to recommend if you give her a follow on social, you'll be able to see a lot of them, and you'll kind of a lot of these things will kind of touch connect and then as you start connecting with them then you're going to want to have the book um not fine as well as also her fine tuning her newest book um which i think is great and i'm looking forward to finding out more about what the third one is going to become but definitely give her a follow um if you want to support my brand check out deli fresh threads um if you want to support the podcast obviously subscribe share tell people about the, the podcast um they're evergreen for a reason i want people to be able to listen to someone even if i talk to them a year or two later because i want people to understand their origin story and find out more about what they're doing um the purpose of this is for me to be able to connect but also for you to be hopefully be inspired um to do something so thank you until next time keep eating sandwiches and follow your passion thanks everyone thank you thank you